On October 7th, uh, Israel suffered a, an attack from that terrorist group, Hamas, and you've been able to watch kind of it all play out on the news channels. So when you see Israel today, uh, you see that these people have basically the best military hardware on the planet. You know, they've got the Iron Dome. Have you heard about the Iron Dome, right? They've got that missile defense system called the Iron Dome that can shoot missiles and rockets out of the sky. They, they make use of things like drones. And, and anytime you see any of those Israeli IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, they all have the, the best body armor on. And, and, I mean, in 1967, when Israel was just a young nation, three Arab nations simultaneously attacked Israel from three different sides. It only took six days for Israel to beat them back. I mean, this Israel is a formidable opponent. They're small, but man, do they, they've got their stuff together and, and they can really put up a fight. But it hasn't always been this way. You know, during the time of Jesus' birth, the nation of Israel was experiencing one of their low points of their existence. Things were, things were very dark. They, they were dismal. I mean, I mean, they had all started out as a family. You know, they'd come out of Egypt, and God had given them this land that he had promised them. But... You know, like families do, they got to arguing and, and fighting and they became divided along tribal lines and the land that God had given them over 1,400 years ago was eventually stripped away from them and they found themselves at the time of Jesus' birth, they found themselves ruled by a distant nation, by a guy thousands of miles away who promoted, and that culture had promoted the, the worship of pagan gods. And so for the Jews, the thing that made them unique, their religion, during that time, it became tainted. The religious leaders became corrupt, and they began to take bribes, and they, lived, they, they put this relentless weight on the people of Israel that they, they expected them to live under the weight of these impossible religious practices. But they're still God's chosen people. And historically, up to the time of Jesus, the prophets had been pointing forward and saying, there's coming a Messiah. There's coming one who will rescue Israel and redeem Israel. But for, at the, for the Israelites at that time, they had no hope. That, that had been a promise that had been made years and years, and they're always reaching for it, and it's always kept away from them. For the last 400 years, God had been silent. There's been no prophets. There's been no word of the Lord. And so at the point that Jesus comes into this world, needless to say, those Jewish people, they are cynical and they are jaded, and it seems as if all hope is gone. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 1. I, I just wanted to set the background there, give you a little, um, give you a little context for what, what's going on in the life of Mary here as we read. Look at Luke 21, or Luke 1, verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, pause, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, she's pregnant with John the Baptist. So she's been pregnant for six months. So John the Baptist will actually be six months older than Jesus. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee. He sent, her to, he sent him to a virgin named Mary and she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, 
and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the Lord, for the word of the Lord of God will never fail. So here's our introduction to Mary. Uh, you see Mary is a poor, innocent Jewish girl. We think she was probably very, very young because women in that culture would, would be uh, betrothed to a husband immediately following puberty. She could be as young as 12 years old. I probably think she's more like 15 or 16, but she's engaged to a man who's older than her. His name Joseph, most likely an arranged marriage. Now, how many of y'all teenage girls in here would like to have an arranged marriage, right? Nobody's down for that. Nobody looks forward to that. But that's what her life was consisting of right at that time. And that, the scriptures tell us that she's from a little village called Nazareth. Now, this is actually one of those places that time has forgotten, right? It's a backwater, inconsequential village. Nothing ever happens there. It's definitely not a place that you'd expect God to appear. God was only thought to show up at the temple. That's the only place where God made an appearance was at the temple. But here, his, one of his messengers in this small town up in the Galilee... But and God never appears to the common man. God only appears to the priests or those that are thought to be super religious. And then when Gabriel arrives, he, he arrives to an ordinary girl in an ordinary town, and it's in a, a, a nation that is mired in the midst of darkness and despair, a nation with no hope. And so in that insignificant village there in the Galilee, in, in, against all odds, an angel by the name of Gabriel appears to Mary. It's completely unexpected. And the message that he bears is earth-shattering. And when he greets Mary, he says, don't be afraid. We see that all the time in Scripture, don't we? Whenever an angel makes an appearance to a human being, that's kind of always, that's the opening line. I, I, they probably learned that in training, don't you think? In angel training, okay, step one, anytime you come in contact with a human, say, don't be afraid, right? I mean, we can understand why. I mean, that, that would be an incredible event, and naturally, you'd probably be scared out of your mind. But he greets Mary, and he says, Mary, don't be afraid. He says, God sees you. You are highly favored. I think that this must be a harrowing experience for Mary. I think it chills her to her bones to see an angel in person. And Gabriel tells her, he says, don't be afraid. And so I, get to, I began to think, you know, if the appearance of the angel didn't scare her, you have to believe that his message scared her, right? I mean, because you want to talk about a message that you never want to hear is that you are pregnant at 15 and, and that you're, it's going to happen and you're not even... You don't even have a, any relations with a man. I mean, can you imagine her fear, her confusion? For her, it'd be like, me? I, I'm nobody. I, I'm just a teenager. And plus, I'm engaged to a guy by the name of Joseph. And so I just begin to think and put myself in her place. I mean, the questions running through my mind. I mean, at, at the very heart of it is, who is ever going to believe this story? Even when I'm telling the truth, nobody's going to buy it. I, whenever I tell them an angel appeared to me and he told me that the Holy Spirit was going to come over me and I'd be pregnant, people are going to go, you've just made that up. So I, I want to point out three things that I see in this particular part of the Christmas story. If you want to take notes or follow along on the back of your study guide, number one is that God is both faithful and sovereign. You know, in the story, what we actually are seeing is God's faithfulness. We're seeing that God has not forgotten his creation. God has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten me. He has not forgotten our problem. And he has not forgotten the promise that he made. You see, I said he has not forgotten our problem. Our problem is sin. You see, we are eternally separated from God because of our sin. Go back, I mean, that's in Genesis 3. You go back to that. God hasn't forgotten our problem. 
And, and, and he knows that we are powerless to do anything about it. We can't be good enough. We can't earn it. There is nothing within us that can save ourselves. And so what we're seeing here is God being faithful to begin the process of creating all things new again. He's making good on the promise that he made back in Genesis 3 to crush Satan. You see, God is the only solution for your sin problem and my sin problem. Only God can deal with that. We're not good enough. There's nothing within us that warrants us to be saved. But God steps through space and time at this very moment here. And he is faithful and he says, I haven't forgotten that you, you have a problem and it's called sin. And I haven't forgotten that I made the promise that I was going to crush Satan's head. And I haven't forgotten the fact that I am going to come in and rescue you. You see, another thing that we saw, not only God's faithfulness, but we see that he's sovereign. I mean, God at this point, he's beginning to put his plan in the action. He sends the angel Gabriel to young Mary, and he, she, he has a surprising message for her, and it is this, God favors you. And God is going to bless you. He has chosen you to bring his son into the world. This is an act of God's grace. You know, there is nothing compelling about Mary. There's nothing special about Mary. She hasn't done anything that puts her on a pedestal. God freely chooses her. It's an act of grace. All we see about Mary is she's a poor, probably illiterate, very young Jewish girl. She's a nobody. And she is the most unlikely choice that you can imagine. However, grace unmerited favor steps in at this point and God chooses her to deliver the divine into the world. Yeah, if, if, to explain this, she is going to be Jesus' host, if you will. She's going to host Jesus into this world and she knows, she number one, she of all people knows, I don't deserve this, I haven't earned this, all I All that I know that's happening to me is because of God's grace. And it's the same grace that you and I exist, that you and I enjoy today. And so his his choice of Mary continually reaffirms what we've always been told in Scripture, and that is that God prefers to work through the weak. God prefers to work through the unassuming and the powerless. You know, we human beings, we've been conditioned to believe that God only works through people who have extreme talent, or God only works through people who are super wealthy, or or he only works through people who are well-connected. Mary is none of those things. So by his choice of choosing Mary, what he's showing is, number one, I'm sovereign, I will do whatever I want to do. And the next thing we see is that it's grace. It's an act of grace. You know, when we say God is sovereign, it's nobody tells God what to do or how to do it. And so if he wants to choose a young teenage girl from nowhere to be the entry point for his son, who are we to say, ah, that's really not the way you should do it, God. But I'd also say this, what makes you think that God can't use you? What makes you think that God doesn't see you? What makes you think that God won't call you or use you or bless you? We, we've just read the story of how God has chosen a nobody from nowhere and he has given her one of the greatest blessings on the planet freely, free of grace. There's nothing she's earned it. But yet we sit around and think, God's not, God can't use me. God won't choose me. God, God won't call me. Stop putting limitations on what God can do in your life. Stop assuming what God will do or won't do. He is a God of grace and He is sovereign and nobody tells Him what to do. God might be at work in some of y'all's life right this moment. And if you turn a hard heart to that, you're going to miss an incredible blessing. The number two thing that I see, if you're still taking notes... We see that Mary is submissive to the will of God. You notice that when he tells her that she's going to be pregnant, 
She doesn't object. She doesn't make excuses. She doesn't even ask for a confirmation. I, here, look how she responds. She says, and this is in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. I am willing to accept whatever he wants. May everything you have said come true. No, she, she doesn't hesitate. I mean, sure, uh, she's got questions. She probably has some quiet reservations about this, but she doesn't object. She doesn't make excuses. I mean, she, but, and she's got plenty of reasons why she should. And also, another thing that I know is she doesn't ask the angel for confirmation about this, which we see that happen all the time in the Old Testament where God would appear to somebody through an angel and give them some information or tell them a plan. And then, you know, they'd say, I need some confirmation. Can you back this up? Can you validate what you're telling me? Mary doesn't ask that. She simply accepts what God says. The only thing that we see come out of her is she begins, she, she has questions about how is this going to be possible? Because she knows that what the angel has just told her is physically impossible. You can't get pregnant. I don't care what the liberals say. You can't get pregnant without having intercourse. It's not possible. And the, her question there in verse 34, she says, how can I have a baby? I'm a virgin. And she's saying to Gabriel, she's saying, uh, how's this going to work? How's this going to happen? Okay, Gabriel, you've... You've just told me what God is going to do, and I completely trust God. I, I, I trust that what he's going to do and what he does, but exactly, can you give me some more information? How is this going to work? How this is going to go down? How am I going to give birth to a child when I've not even known a man? By the way, some of your translations may use that word, no. That's another word for intimacy, knowing somebody intimately. And so the lesson that I see in all of this is that God is a God of impossibilities. He can take the impossible and make it probable. God is going, and when she asks the question, how is this going to work? Gabriel kind of reveals that God is going to kind of reach into his bag of tricks and he's going to use an, his original strategy for creation. And he's going to create life by the Holy Spirit. If you go back in Genesis chapter 1 and read the creation story, you'll see it say that the Spirit of God was hovering over the earth. And then you go into John 1 and you'll see that God creates life through the Spirit. But this supernatural event here, it, for Mary, it's going to be incredibly difficult to explain, right? Uh, you know, people are going to say, so how did you get pregnant again? She's going to go, uh... Yeah, about that. Um, you know, can you imagine today if that happened in, in our community? A, a girl mysteriously gets pregnant? Nobody in here would buy it, would they? We would be, yeah, aha, uh -huh, sure, right? Wink, elbow, right. And I mean, let's, let's just be honest about what faces her. This is scandalous. I mean, this is a very small village. Everybody knows everybody else. And getting pregnant out of wedlock at that time is super shameful. And it, it carries with it this incredible social stigma that, that follows, will follow her wherever she goes. She is going to be the talk of the coffee shop. Everybody is going to know her name going to know what happened, and they, and I can just imagine, can you imagine all of the names that people are going to call her? Can, can you imagine, she is going to spend, she's probably, let's call her 15. For the next 70 years of her life, she's going to spend defending her own honor. She's going to have, she's going to have this be her reputation. And the child the child is forever going to be labeled as illegitimate. What's her friends going to say? Are they going to support her? I mean, what about her? I mean, when she goes into the marketplace, is she going to be discriminated? When she goes in the synagogue, will she even be allowed in the synagogue? What's her parents going to say? Are they going to kick her out? Are they going to send her away? 
And, and what's, what's her future husband going to do? Joseph. I mean, he's been disgraced, and by law, he can have her stoned. He, if nothing less, he can at least divorce her. And so Mary has, is choosing, is allowing God to pour something out on her that is going to be very, very painful. It's going to be very, very challenging. And, and not only that, but it's going to be a huge responsibility. I mean, can you imagine being the person asked to raise the Son of God? What an incredible burden. I mean, I, I, would, I would take that kid and I would have one of them Apple tags put in him like a tracking device so I'd always know where he is, right? Or, or I'd probably wrap him up in bubble, uh, in bubble wrap and, and put him in a, in a closet and lock the door. I mean, it's hard enough raising children in, in this society today, right? Let alone raising the Son of God Nobody wants to be known as the parent who lost God's son. I mean, you would never let him out of your sight. If that kid gets the sniffles, I mean, you're going to have the finest physicians on the planet calling because it's God's son. It's an incredible responsibility. She is going to be the ultimate helicopter parent. Uh, but I think that, I, I don't think that any of those challenges or or the fears, they don't phase Mary because she just simply responds with com complete submission. She says, look at the scripture again, it's in Luke. She says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. That word for servant there literally means slave. It's not a negative form of slave. It is you command me and I do it. And so she says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And so as, as we see this play out in Mary's life, I begin to think, how can you call all of this happening to a 15-year-old girl in the middle of nowhere, how can you call that a blessing? How can you, being chosen to get pregnant with a child at such a young age, out of wedlock, how can you call that a blessing? Well, number three is because the child will be a blessing to both Mary and to the entire world. You see, this is going to be a son. That's what the angel said. It's going to be a son. You're going to name him Jesus. Nothing wrong with girls. But if you're a Hebrew and you have, you're starting a family, you're going to want a son because you want him to carry the family legacy forward. But the angel said that not only will he be a son, but he will be great, and he'll be called the son of the Most High. And that is a very literal t uh, title that distinguishes this child from the other children that will ever be born. And the angel also tells Mary, he says, he will be given the throne of David and called the Son of God. You see, this is a child that is destined for royalty. He's going to be a king. And how ironic is that? I say that because illegitimate children were not allowed to be king. They were not allowed to be royals. They were not allowed to serve as princes and princesses and kings and queens. But the angel's message here is this child that you will give birth to, he is going to lay a legitimate claim to David's throne. And so any way that you look at it, this child that will be born to you is going to be a true descendant of David and Judah. He will be the king. He will be, and the angel even says he'll be the king forever, verse 33, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. You know, the only, and if you're a Jew, you know that the only king that will rule forever with no end is the Messiah. She knows Gabriel is telling her, you're not just going to be giving birth to a, a special child. This is the Messiah. And so that's the blessing. Mary will become the mother, the host of the Messiah, and the whole world will be blessed as well. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, All praise to God, 
the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united in Christ. So as I, as I finish, I just want you to take a moment, put yourself in Mary's shoes for just a second. I mean, would, how would you have responded? Would you have just offered yourself in complete submission? Probably not. You might eventually have come to that point, but I'm sure there would be a lot of objections, a lot of questions, a lot of hesitations, maybe some excuses. But Mary, it's almost like she just said, I am your slave. You do with me what you want. I fully trust that God is in the middle of this. Yeah, it's going to mean personal pain and suffering for me and my reputation. But if God's calling me to it, it will be a blessing. And so here's, here's just wrap it up, just a couple things I, I want to re, kind of reiterate, and that is the fact that God's plans, they often do bring adversity, they often do bring confusion, and there may be times in your life where God asks you to do something that is super confusing. He may ask something of you that's not on your radar, He might ask you of, to do something that you really don't want to do. But every single one of us in here have to get used to the idea that we might be called into situations that might be daunting. We might be called into situations that uh, are ultimately going to lead us to fulfill God's purpose and plan. You've got to get used to that. It might not be comfortable. It might not be exactly what you want to do. But will your response be yes? And another thing I see is that God is not limited by our limitations. You know, God is the God of unlimited power. He can do anything. And He he loves to do His greatest work through the most unlikely sources and most unlikely people. He loves to work through the weak and the powerless and the, the, the nobodies. So if that's what you're thinking about yourself, that you're a nobody in an insignificant little village in the middle of southwest Missouri, I got news for you, God will use you. God can do great things from anybody that submits their life wholly to Him. You see, God only asks us to be willing servants. That's all He asks. And in the end, Mary's response is, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. So I'd ask you this morning, will you respond as Mary did when God comes to you and asks you to do difficult things uncomfortable things? Will you be willing to lay aside your agenda for your life? I mean, think about that for just a second. Do you think that Mary really thought that her whole life was going to look like that? Don't you think she had her own hopes and dreams about what her future was going to look like? Don't you think that that she had this idea that maybe her and Joseph would get married and, and maybe they'd move somewhere and he'd start a business and, and they'd experience a little bit of financial success and maybe they'd have a few kids and maybe he would rise to prominence in the village or whatever? All of that is shattered. All of that's gone. But God is looking for ordinary people like you and me to say Yes. He doesn't look for the wealthy. He doesn't look for the famous or the powerful. God wants anyone who will be in complete submission to his will. And the end of all this is those who are willing to do so will receive great blessings and be a blessing to the rest of the world. So make your yes be an emphatic, I am your servant. Do with me as you will. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the story of of the incarnation, Jesus' birth into this world. I'm, I'm so grateful, Lord, for the way that you work. Lord, I'm grateful for this plan to rescue mankind, to provide us a way, to provide us with salvation. And what grace that is, we don't deserve it, we haven't earned it that you are so kind and gracious and that you, in your ultimate plan that existed from the beginning of the world was to choose this little peasant girl from the middle of nowhere 
and you would introduce your son to us and you would send him to the cross to die for our sins. We worship you for that. We praise your holy name. Lord, may you receive all the glory, honor, and praise that is due to you because you are a rescuer. You are our savior. You are our king. You are mighty and holy and you you deserve all of the glory and praise that we can muster. And it's in the precious name of the one who laid his life down. Even so, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone, even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.